as I've said, that there's certain things that we all long for. One of them is longing for the truth. We looked at that. Another thing we long for is to have a clear conscience. Uh, and because we don't have a clear conscience, we long for some form of salvation or a savior. Well, the question is, can we trust Jesus? Is he trustworthy? Well, another question we can ask Muslims, can we trust Muhammad? Can we trust him? And one way you learn to trust someone is not just by what they say, but how they live. The fidelity of their life, the consistency of their life, speaks volumes if the person is trustworthy. And his, his character, the way he conducts himself, speaks volumes on if he speaks the truth or lies. Someone who is in an affair, how can you trust what he says if his life and actions are inconsistent? How can you trust what he says if his, if his daily conduit, conduct is full of hypocrisy? Well, one of the things we want to look at when we look at Islam is the life of Muhammad and ask the question, can we trust him? Can we trust Muhammad? Can Muslims trust Muhammad? And can Muslims trust Christ? So we want to do a side-by-side -side comparison of Muhammad with Jesus Christ and see which one is trustworthy. We want to do this by looking at the Quran itself and the Hadiths. So rather than judging Jesus strictly by the Scriptures and the Scriptures testimony of Jesus, which we should do, we're going to look at the Quran and the Hadiths and see what they say about Muhammad and see what this literature says about Jesus. So the two points that we have when we under the broad question, can we trust Muhammad, is this. What does Muslims believe about Muhammad and Jesus? And secondly, what Muslims should believe about Muhammad and Jesus. And doing this would do it just a side-by-side -side comparison of the two prophets. First of all, what Muslims believe about Muhammad and Jesus. What is the Quran and the Hadith, the two major sources of knowledge that Muslims look to? What does their literature say about Muhammad and about the Lord Jesus? First of all, what does Muslims believe about Muhammad, the seal of the prophets? One, they believe Muhammad was spoken about and prophesied about and the Torah and the gospel. If you're witnessing to a Muslim, they'll often say, well, your scriptures speaks and refers to Muhammad. Your scriptures, the, the, the Old and New Testament, confirm Muhammad's ministry. See, we've got to remember Muhammad and the Quran do not question or did not question the fidelity of the Old and New Testament. 5 verse 68, Say, O people of the Scriptures, you have no guidance till you observe the Torah and the Gospel, that which was revealed unto you from your Lord. So here is the Quran saying to Jews and Christians, you do not have guidance until you go to your own scriptures and read them. Muhammad believed the Torah and the Gospels were, were faithful. They were not corrupt. Muhammad believed that the Old and New Testament were trustworthy guides to lead to truth. Muhammad commanded the Jews and Christians to judge according to their scriptures, according to their books. Sir 10, 94. And if thou be in doubt concerning that which we have sent down unto thee, then ask those who have read the books before thee, as surely hath the truth come unto thee from the Lord. So be of them that do not doubt. Sir 29, 46. And dispute not with the people of the book unless it be in the best manner, save those of them who who are doing wrong, and say, We believe in that which have been sent down unto us, and that which have been sent down unto you. Our God 
and your God is one. In fact, Muhammad himself sought to validate his own calling as a prophet by appealing to the authority of the Old and New Testaments. Surah 7, 157. It says, The unlettered prophet, or the one who does not know how to read or write, the unlettered prophet whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, in the law, in the scriptures. And then it goes on to say in, in, in Surah 10, 94. So if you, O Muhammad, are in doubt concerning that which we have revealed unto you, that your name is written in the Torah and in the gospel, then ask those who are reading the book, the Torah and the gospel for before you. Verily the truth has come to you from your Lord. So be not of those who doubt it. So Muhammad is still questioning, is he really called or is he possessed with a jinn or with Satan? And, he's, and he gets a revelation. He says, if you're still in doubt, go and read the Old and New Testament. They speak of you. And the various Old and New Testament passages that support this, they would go to Deuteronomy 18.15. The Lord your God will rise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And remember, Muhammad was prophesied that he would be a prophet by this Christian monk. And remember, he had a family member that confirmed him as being in the line of the prophets. And no doubt he was, someone had told him that, hey, they were looking for the Messiah. The Jews were looking for their Messiah. And then, then they looked at this, this passage and they said, this is where God spoke of you. And in the New Testament, they would go to passages like John 14, 16, where Jesus says, I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper to be with you forever. And the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. So He's the promise of the, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. John 15, 26, 27. But when the Helper comes, when, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So Muhammad is the helper. And Muslims will look at that word and the Greek word is paraclete, right? And the, which means helper, which is very close to this other word called parakletos. Very similar, it sounds very similar to that. And if that word translated in Arabic is Ahmad, which means praised one. And that's the meaning of Muhammad, praised one. And so paraclete sounds very, cl very close to another Greek word that if you translated it, means praised one. So I said, look, there, there he's mentioned by name. I will send Muhammad and he will lead you into all truth. So Muslims say, look, your own scriptures testify that Muhammad is indeed the prophet of God. In fact, Muslims believe that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. He's the final, the greatest of all the prophets. On whyislam.com, which is probably the most well-known site on, uh, on Islam. In fact, they, they're the ones that advertise in New York on billboards, on buses, whyislam.com. And they, they, they're seeking to convert Westerners to the Islamic faith. This is what it says about Muhammad. Islam is the culmination of the universal message of God taught by all his prophets. Muslims believe that a prophet was chosen to every nation at some point in their history, enjoining them to worship God alone and delivering guidance on how to live peacefully with others. Some of the prophets of God include Adam, Noah, Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and Jesus, and Muhammad, peace be upon them all. 
The prophets of all conveyed the consistent divine message of worshiping one God along with specific social laws for each nation's circumstances. However, after the prophets delivered the divine guidance to their people, their message was lost, abandoned, or changed over time. Now, this is a modern understanding. This is not what the Quran says. But now, now that modern Muslims have access to the Old and New Testament, they see that this is not what the Old Testament is saying. They see that this is not what the New Testament is saying. It's not teaching the same thing that the Quran is teaching. So modern Muslims are saying somehow that message has been perverted, lost, or warped over time. And the reason Muhammad has come is to rectify the corruption that has come in the Torah and in the Gospel. And, and so God sent Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the final prophet to all of humanity. It goes on to say in 610, the angel Gabriel visited Muhammad, peace be upon him, with the first divine message. For the next 23 years, he continued to receive revelations until the message was completed. Muhammad, peace be upon him, called people towards the belief in one God, encouraged them to be just and merciful to one another. He was a living example. This is key. He was a living example of God's guidance for the benefit of the entire humankind. And this is why for Muslims, it's not just the Quran. They don't have sola scriptura or sola Quran. It's the Quran plus the Hadith. And the Hadiths are the, the written history of the sayings and actions of Muhammad. Because Muhammad is the living example of how to follow Allah. So if you want to know how to please Allah, imitate Muhammad. Follow his example. In fact, Surah 3340 says, Muhammad is the messenger of God and the seal of of the prophets. So he's the last prophets. He seals the prophets and after him we should expect no more prophets. Now throughout all the Old and New Testament one way a prophets would verify that they were from God they would do something that only God could do. I mean if you come up to me and he says thus say of the Lord and you have something new to say to me and I have not heard about this why would I believe you? Yeah, okay, sure, sure, God said that. We would question these people who claim to be hearing and speaking on God's behalf. How do I know you're God's messenger? How do I know you're the prophet of God? Where well, God verified his prophets throughout the Old Testament period and in the New Testament by giving them signs, giving them miracles. When you do something that only God can do, man, you're forced to have to listen to this guy. How do I know you're speaking from, for God? Man, you raise them from the dead? Now that just doesn't happen. So it's proof. It's God's divine stamp of approval. Listen to him. You know, he is a messenger. He is a prophet. He speaks on my behalf. And here are the miracles or the proofs or the signs of his calling. Of his, that he is a ordained messenger sent from God. But why would we listen to Muhammad? What miracle does he have? What did he do to verify that he actually spoke for God? Well, Muhammad himself says, I'm the seal of the prophets. Muslims believe he's the greatest of all the prophets. But they admit that he had no miracle. Even Muhammad says, I have no miracles. The only miracle that they have at all to testify that Muhammad is someone we should trust and believe is the Quran itself. And this is the miracle of the Quran. They would say Muhammad was illiterate and there's no way someone that was illiterate could have ever wrote such a beautiful piece of literature. Impossible. In fact, they believe the Quran is the most beautiful of all literatures that's ever been written. In fact, the Quran, it says, is if you, if you doubt that this is from God, you try to write one chapter or surah like this. You'll see that you cannot do it. Surah 11.13, 
Oh, they may say, he forged it. Say, bring ye the ten sores forged like unto it, and call to your aid whomever you will other than God, and speak the truth. If then they answer not your call, know you that this revelation is sent down with the knowledge of God. Sir 2.23, and if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed from time to time to our servant, then produce a sore like thereunto, and call your witnesses or your helpers, if there are any, by your side. He goes in Surah 1038, Oh, do they say, he has forged it. Say then, produce a single chapter like it. Call upon whomever you can, apart from God, if you are truthful. In one hadith, it says, Every prophet was given signs or miracles because of which people believed in him. Indeed, I have given him the divine revelation that God has revealed to me. So what is the sign that God gave Muhammad so we can trust in him and believe that he speaks on God's behalf? Well, it's the Quran itself. The Hadith goes on to say, So I hope to have the most followers of all the prophets on the day of resurrection. So Muhammad says, I think I will have more followers than Moses, than Abraham, than Job, and even Jesus. Because I have the greatest of all the signs. The greatest of the signs is the Quran itself. They believe the Quran has been perfectly preserved throughout all the generations. They believe it, it gave uh, these amazing prophecies. In fact, the most notable prophecy is in 614, the Romans lost Jerusalem. They lost Jerusalem to, this, um, to the Persians. And Muhammad says, in a few years, Romans are going to conquer it back. And a few years could mean three to nine years. And the Romans did conquer it back. They did regain Jerusalem, but it took nine to 12 years. So it may have happened. But, you know, that prophecy would be like the Holland Globetrotters getting beat. And you say, well, they're going to win the next one. You know, yeah, Rome lost Jerusalem. But it wasn't that audacious of a prophecy to predict, yeah, they're going to regain that one. And so they look at this as their greatest fulfilled prophecy uh, to verify that the Quran is indeed of God. But they're looking at the fact that Muhammad wrote this or given it by dictation, and there's no way he could have done that on his own. And they say Muhammad lived the most exemplary life for the rest of us to follow According to legend, Muhammad was born clean, circumcised, and his navel cord already cut. In Surah 33, 21, it says, Indeed, the messenger of Allah, you have a good example to follow for him who hopes for the meeting with Allah on the last day. So if you're getting ready to meet Allah on the last day, follow Muhammad's example. Surah 33, 36, it says, It is not for a believer, man or woman, when Allah and His messengers have decreed a matter that they should have any option in their decisions. And whoever disobeys Allah and His messenger, he has indeed strayed in, the, in a plain era. So Muslim is not just what God says in the Quran. The Quran is divine speech from Allah. The Hadiths is the speech of Muhammad. So Muslims want to believe what God says, and they also want to believe what Muhammad says. And that's why they took down the, the sayings of Muhammad. And for, the, for the, the devout Muslims, it's important to know what Muhammad says, and he is to be obeyed just as much as Allah is to be obeyed. And this is why the Sunnah, and the Hadiths are so important to Muslims. The Sunnahs are the books that record his actions. The Hadiths are the books that record his statements or words. In fact, according to the most important Muslim theologian, which we talked about in our last session, who wrote in the 12th century, this is what he says. Know that the key to happiness is to follow the Sunnah, 
That's Muhammad's actions. And to imitate the messenger of God in all of his coming and going, his movement and his rest, in the way of eating, his attitude, his sleep, and his talk. God has said, what the messenger has brought, accept it. And what he has prohibited, refrain from it. That means you have to sit while putting on your trousers and to stand when putting on your turban. And to begin the right foot when putting on the shoes. That's because that's the way Muhammad did it. He put on his pants sitting down and when he, he stand up to put his turban on. In fact, Muslims will step into the restroom with their left foot forward. They always step in a restroom left foot because that's how Muhammad would step in a restroom. Uh, you'll see a lot of uh, Muslims, they'll have a beard and they'll shave their mustache because that's what Muhammad did. Muhammad wore his pants above his ankles. We call them high waters. Well, Muslims do the same. Many devout Muslims, they want to follow the pattern of Muhammad. In fact, one man, one Muslim refused to eat watermelon. And they asked, why will you not eat watermelon? He goes, well, because we don't believe Muhammad ate watermelon. And it's not that we know if he would eat it or not eat it. It's just the fact we don't know how he would cut the melon or how he would proceed to eat the melon. And since we don't know that, I refrain from eating watermelon. So, literally, Muhammad lived an exemplary life for all to follow and to imitate. In fact, some Muslims, not all of them, but a great many of them believe that Muhammad must intercede on your behalf. We talked about assurance of salvation in our last session. I didn't bring this up because I, did, I didn't want to make it seem like all Muslims view that Muhammad must pray for you or intercede for you. But many Muslims come to the point that they really believe Muhammad must intercede on your behalf. In fact, one theologian says that many who have died and gone to hell have been brought out of hell and brought into paradise on the basis of Muhammad's prayers for them. And according to the book Answering Islam, not only is Muhammad given the permission to intercede, but his intercession is so effective that many of those who have been originally condemned to hell are released from hell and taken to heaven due to the mercy of the prophet. In fact, Muhammad has become deified in some traditions, Islamic traditions. And this is, this is amazing because they believe in monotheism and there's no association with, association with God and you must keep God above everything. But I think it's because in Islam there's no relationship with God. You can't have a relationship with Him. You can only serve His will, but you can't know Him, personally know Him. You can't personally interact with Him. And even paradise is not a relationship eternally living with God or with living with Allah. Paradise is just you having all your dreams fulfilled, having health and wealth and prosperity and abundance. That's paradise. So, so Muslims don't have a relationship with Allah. I think it's, 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 a, it's just a natural tendency for them to, to cling to Muhammad. At least he's a person. At least he's personable. And in so doing, as some of them have almost deified him. Abdul Salib says, It is generally agreed that according to Orthodox Islam, the purpose of man is not to know God and become more conformed to his character, but to understand his will and become more obedient to his commands. And Kenneth Cragg says, The revelation communicated God's law. It does not reveal God himself. Islam is finally the law it's a, it's a theology is law, not the theology of God himself. In the last analysis, the sense of God is a sense of divine command. In the will of God, there is none of the mystery that surrounds his being. His demands are known, and the believer's task is not so much to explore who God is. It's not even to, to have fellowship with him but rather to obey Him. 
So with an unknowable God, it's easy to see why Muslims come close to deifying Muhammad. And I think it's for this reason Muslims are more, were more accepting if you, you, can, you can critique Allah, and they don't like that. But what you cannot do is critique Muhammad. In fact, anyone who mocks or questions Muhammad is in danger of being put to death. In fact, Surah 3357 says, Those who insult God and His messenger, God has cursed them in this life, in the life hereafter. Surah 332, Say, Obey Allah and the messenger. So obey Allah and Muhammad. But if they turn away, then indeed Allah does not love their dis the disbeliever. Surah 48, 29, Muhammad is the messenger of God and those with him are forceful against the unbelievers. In fact, some traditions, Muhammad is praised in verse with these words. If Muhammad had not been, God himself would not have existed. So they get close to putting Muhammad is uh, uh, and they, they don't do it, but they get close to putting God, Muhammad, equally with God. I mean, it's like almost they're, they're trying to avoid the sin of shrek, of association, anything with God. But in a roundabout way, they tend to exalt Muhammad into that place. Now, we can worship Jesus as God, but we're, that's consistent with our theology. It's not consistent for Muslims to worship Muhammad in the way that they do. So this is what Muslims believe about Muhammad. They really trust him. They look up to him. In fact, his, to the point that his actions and his sayings are as good as the actions and sayings of God. The Quran says, obey Muhammad. Follow his example. And that's why the Hadiths are so important to, to Muslims. So what does Muslims believe about Jesus? Well, Jesus is mentioned 97 times in the Quran. <clears throat> Remember, there's only 114 different surahs. So that's, I mean, he's mentioned 97 times. That's a lot. The Quran teaches us that Jesus was born a virgin. He was not pre-incarnate, but he's a new creation. Surah 359 says, the likeness of Jesus in God's side is that of Adam. He created him from dust, then said to him, be and he was. And so it's almost like Jesus did not pre-exist in eternity past, but in Mary's womb, he, God says, be. He, he born of a virgin birth, but God spoke him into existence, if you would, in the womb. Sir 29, 30, 29, 91 says, and she, talking about Mary, who guarded her virginity, we breathe into her our spirit and made her and her son a sign to the world. They also believed that Mary was a virgin. Surah 19, 22 through 33, talking about Mary. So she conceived him and she withdrew with him to a remote place and the pains of childbirth drove her to the trunk of a palm tree. She said, I wish I had died before this. And had been long forgotten. See, Mary was worried that the people would think badly of her that she was not married. Then baby Jesus called from below her. Just baby at this time. Saying, do not be sad. Your Lord has provided a stream under you. Shake the trunk of the palm tree towards you and it will drop on you fresh ripe dates. So eat and drink and be happy. And if you see any human, then say, Indeed, I have vowed a fast to the most merciful, so I will not speak to any human today. Then she carried him and brought him to her people. They said, O oh Mary, indeed, you have done a great evil. O oh sister of Aaron, your father was not an evil man, and your mother was not a fornicator. So she pointed to him, they said, how can we speak to a child in the cradle? Jesus said, 
Indeed, I am a slave of God. He has given me the scriptures and made me a prophet, and he has made me blessed wherever I may be, and he has enjoined on me prayer and charity as long as I remain alive, and has made me kind to my mother, and did not make me arrogant or miserable. And peace be upon me the day I was born, and the day I will die, and the day I will be raised alive. So this is in the Quran speaking about Jesus' own virgin birth. They believe he was a prophet. Um, in Surah 20, Sur 19, verse 22, when his family and friends begin to question Mary's pregnancy, she pointed to the cradle and Jesus, the baby, would speak to him and verified that he indeed was a prophet of God. They believe Jesus taught Islam. They believe Jesus was not divine. And they believe that Jesus did not die on the cross. In fact, Surah 4, 157 says, And for their saying, when we had killed the Messiah, Jesus the Son of Mary, the messenger of God, in fact, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. Because Muhammad thought it, it was disrespectful for any of the prophets to die a shameful death. Allah would not allow that to happen. And they don't believe that Allah himself, I mean, Muhammad himself died a shameful death, even though tradition says, the history book says, that he died of poison by a Jewish woman. But most Muslims deny that, because that's a shameful way of dying. So Muhammad denied that Jesus could have died a shameful death. But he goes on to say, in fact, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it only appeared to them as if they did. Indeed, those who differ about him are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumptions. Certainly, they did not kill him. Rather, God raised him up to himself. God is mighty and wise. So most Muslims believe that Jesus did not die on the cross, but during the time of his trial and he was beaten, sometime it only appeared like he died. So God took him to heaven and he placed someone in Jesus' place. Most Muslims believe Judas was the one who died on the cross, that God somehow put Judas on the cross. And they, they believe in some form of spoon theory that it appeared like Jesus died, but he really didn't die on the cross. And um, some think that miraculously the image of Judas' face was put on Jesus' face. And so they thought they had Jesus, but in reality they were crucifying Judas. And they, Muslims believe that Jesus could not have been a substitute payment for our sins. Muslims do not believe in substitutionary atonement. Surah 17, 15 says, Who receives guidance receives it for his own benefit. Who goes astray does it so to his own loss. No bearer of burdens can bear the burden of another. Surah 53, 38, That no burdened person with sins shall bear the burdens or sins of another. And so Muslims would ask this question. How is it fair and just for a God to punish the wrong person? How is that fair? Now, that's a legitimate question. And we need to be able to answer that. So think about that. How is it fair for God to put to death someone who's innocent? Would you be satisfied as a parent to punish the wrong child when you know the child didn't do anything wrong? Could you do that? And if you were a child, would you think that that's okay? Now, going back to um, um, my wife's cousin who was murdered. and they, they can, The man is guilty. His DNA evidence is in his fingernails. What if this murderer said, I know I'm guilty, but I have a brother that said he'll take my place. And his brother, who did not commit the crimes, said, I'll take 
I'll take my brother's place. Put me to death or put me into prison. I'll take the crimes of my brother. I know I didn't do it, but I'll be a willing substitute on his behalf. Would you be happy with that? Would you be satisfied knowing that the wrong person is put into prison, the wrong person may be put to death, and all the while the guilty person is free? Even if the guilty person says he's truly sorry and is truly remorseful, could you be satisfied with the wrong person being punished? Well, Muslim says you can't punish the wrong person. This is insane. Rob Bell, uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad you know who he is. He says the cross is cosmic child abuse. And Muslims would agree with that. How do you answer that? Well, they say it can't be answered. There's no way a just God would punish an innocent, his innocent son for those who are guilty. He's too just to do so. But they do believe Jesus is coming back at the end of the age to establish the Islam, Islamic State. Now, this is what Muslims believe about Muhammad, and they believe about Jesus. So they believe in Jesus. He's a prophet. Now, he's not divine. He didn't die for sins. But he's a prophet who taught Islam. And they believe Muhammad is the greater prophet who they model their life from. Now, this last half of this session, I want to turn our attention to what Muslims should believe about Muhammad and what they should believe about Jesus. So what should they believe about Muhammad? First of all, Muhammad was not prophesied in the Bible. Deuteronomy 18.15, The Lord your God will rise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Now, this disqualifies Muhammad immediately. It disqualifies him as being the prophet prophesied. Because the prophecy says, I will raise up from you, from your own kinsmen, from your own brothers, a prophet. In fact, the word brothers there means fellow Israelite. It's contrast to a foreigner. As when God told Israel to choose a king from their own brethren. And Deuteronomy 17, 15. Their own brethren meant from the lineage of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Even the Quran claims that the prophetic line came through Isaac and not Ishmael. Surah 29, 27. So they even admit that the, the line lineage of prophets came to the Jews. So why would God raise up a prophet, not from the brethren, but from his enemy, their enemies? So Deuteronomy 18.15 does not allow for Muhammad to fulfill that prophecy. But the Lord Jesus obviously is an Israelite and can fulfill that prophecy. What about John 14.17? And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom, he, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. And listen to this, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Muslims don't believe Muhammad lives within us or lives within them. But this prophecy of a helper is someone who dwells within the followers of God. This cannot be Muhammad. Jesus actually says to the disciples, you already know him. He already dwells with you. And he will be in you. But you already know them. The disciples of Jesus did not know Muhammad. John 15, 26 is another passage that they look at. But when the Helper comes, when I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness of because you have been with me from the beginning. Now, this can't be Muhammad either. Muhammad does not proceed from the Father. This would make Muhammad divine. Muhammad's message was not centered on Christ. 
And what Jesus says, and he will testify of me. That this helper, his main message would be the message of Jesus Christ. John 14, 26 clearly identifies the helper as the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 says, But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send you in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you in remembrance all that I have said to you. James White says of this, One of the Quran's most central claims about Muhammad is, that with, is without a foundation. The argument is false and cannot be maintained in light of honest and consistent argumentation. What does this mean for the prophetic claims of, the, of Muhammad? Muhammad believed that the Torah and the Gospels in the possession of the people of his day pointed to him. And we know we possess today what they had then. And it does not point to Muhammad. Obviously, we, the Bible, Old and New Testament, did not prophesy of Muhammad. Muhammad does not meet the qualifications of those texts. Secondly, Muhammad did not live exemplary life. And this is important. Can we trust him? Well, we can't trust the Old and New Testament speaks of him. Can we trust him by looking at his character, his example, his life? Well, Muslims in the Quran are to only have four wives. You can marry, but you can only have four wives. That's what Allah says. Four wives. Well, some, it's debatable, but Muhammad either had nine or up to 17 wives. So why, why is he the exception? Well, also Muhammad married his adopted son's wife, Zainab. We heard that story last night. And basically, to review you of that story, he goes and sees his, uh, his adopted son, whom he adopted, and he goes to his house, and he's not home. But his wife is there, his um, daughter-in-law is there, and she happened to not be fully clothed, and he said something under his breath, praise be to God. And she recognized that she, rec she recognized that he was referring to her beauty. And anyway, when her husband comes home, he relays that, she relays that to her husband. That it was a, not a very good marriage. And so he uh, said, I'll divorce my wife. So you can marry her. But all of, I mean, Muhammad already had four wives. And so he already had four wives. This is his son's wife. And in that culture, that was considered incest. But he thought she was beautiful. Um, and so he gets a new prophecy. We heard about that last night. And it's in Surah 33, 36. It is not for any believer, man or woman, when God and his messengers have decided a matter to have liberty to choose in their decision. Whoever disobeys God and his messengers has gone far astray. When you said to him whom God had blessed and you had favored, keep your wife to yourself and fear God, but you hid within yourself that what God was to reveal to you. And when you feared the people, but it was God who was you were supposed to fear. Then when Zaid in, indeed ended his relationship with her, we gave her to you in marriage, that there may be no restrictions for believers regarding the wives of their adopted sons. When their relationships has ended, the command of God was fulfilled. There is no blame on the prophet regarding what God has ordained for him. So this is divine revelation is internally passed, put on the coal, the tablets of stone, telling Muhammad that it's okay for him to marry his daughter-in-law that recently divorced his adopted son. His other wife, the one he married that was six years old, Aisha, Aisha said this, I fear that your Lord hastens in fulfilling your wishes and your desires. 
So even Aisha realized that Allah seems to just give Muhammad what he wants and when he wants it. No matter that this included divorce, no matter that he was already married to four wives, no matter that this was his daughter-in-law, and no matter that this would end adoption from there, that point forward. In fact, Surah 33, 4 says, Allah has not made for any man two hearts in his one body, nor has he made your wives whom you divorce by Zayar, your mothers, nor has he made your adopted sons your sons, such only your manner of speech by which with your mouths. But Allah tells you the truth. And he shows the right way. Call them by the names of their fathers. That is just in the sight of Allah. But if you know not their father's name, call them your brothers in the faith. Or your... But there is no blame on you if you make a mistake therein. What counts is the intention of your heart. And Allah is forgiving. He's merciful. So he gets a revelation saying, this adoption was not seen in the sight of God. This is really not your son. You, you don't have to feel guilty that you're marrying your daughter-in-law. Which ends adoption for Muslims even to this day. Muhammad also sanctioned husbands beating their wives. Surah 434, men are in charge of women because Allah had made the one to excel the other. As for those whom you fear rebellion, admonish them and banish them to their beds and scourge them. So you husbands who have testy wives, go ahead and banish them to their beds and if necessary, scourge them. Muhammad listened to the jinn when he gave the syntactic verses. How can you trust this man if later he says, wait, I was mistaken. The revelations I got was not from Allah. It was from Satan, or Satan's messenger. So he admits that he's mistaken. And not just mistaken in a minor issue, he's mistaken in the revelation of God. Is this someone we can trust? Muhammad sanctioned and participated in the caravan raids in fact, one of the raids, it was on the Sabbath, their Sabbath day. And the caravans would always travel on that day because they knew that they could trust people not to fight. No one would fight during that time. And Muhammad sent out 10 of his, uh, 10 Muslims that went to, and he sent them out on a mission and he gave them a letter and said, don't open it until you get to a certain place. Then open it and obey and it happened to be on that Sabbath day, they opened up the letter and it said to raid the caravan. And many of them said, we can't do this. This is not right. This is against God. But yet they followed Muhammad's instructions and they would end up raiding the caravan. Remember how Muhammad had that Jewish poet murdered? Remember there was a Jewish poet, Medina, who had some type of poem that, that made light of Muhammad. Muhammad asked, who's going to take care of this? Someone says, I'll take care of you, take care of him, I'll kill him. So a few assassins went, brought him out of his home in the middle of the night, and assassinated him because he wrote something negative about Muhammad. Muhammad also sanctioned jihad. In fact, some of the Hadiths, it says, all his apostles said, I have ordained to fight with the people till they say, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. It is not fitting for a prophet that he should have prisoners of war and free them with ransom until he's made a great slaughter among his enemies. And he also says in one of the Hadiths, whomever changes his Islamic religion, then kill him. In fact, after Muhammad's death, you have the apostate wars, or many Muslims go back to polytheism after Muhammad died. And so uh, the Muslim army goes, and it's called the apostate wars, and they go and slay those who have forsaken Muslims. That's why when we have witnessed to Muslims, realize 
that if they forsake Islam, they're endangering their life. And the question would be asked, if a Western Muslim, you ask him, if you have a friend who becomes a Christian, one of your Islamic brothers become a Christian, should you kill him? Most of them will answer this, because we live in the West, we should not. But if we lived in the Islamic State, they should be put to death. But this is by the sanctions and the command of Muhammad himself. Muhammad did not perform any miracles. To say his literary style, the literary style of the Quran proves that it's a divine miracle really proves nothing. On the eternal tablets of stone that is written on gold, This is one of the things that, must, that was written on those tablets. Surah 33, 53. O oh, you who believe, do not enter the home of the prophet unless you are given permission to come over for a meal. So don't just go knocking on Muhammad's door seeing if you can come visit him. And do not wait for its preparation. And when you are invited, go in. And when you have eaten, Disperse without lingering for conversation. This irritates the prophet. And he shies away from you, but God does not shy away from the truth. And when you ask his wives for something, ask them from behind a screen. That is pure for your hearts and their hearts. You must never offend the messenger of God, nor must you ever marry his wives after him. For that would be sin with God. So here, in this eternal tablets of gold, here's a surah that we cannot reproduce. This is something that's beautifully written. This one is about how to conduct yourself in Muhammad's house. And so when you're invited, come in, eat your meal, and when you're done eating, excuse yourself and do not linger for conversation because this irritates the prophet. Well, We just ask ourselves, and we've already looked at this a little bit, these eternal tablets, is this not the sin of Shrek? Is not the eternal tablets something that could be associated with God, but not God? Why would eternal tablets have verses that needed to be abrogated? Why would eternal tablets have satanic verses written upon them? Why would eternal tablets have non-Arabic words. In fact, there are over a hundred non-Arabic words and they said the language of God is in Arabic. But many of the words in the Quran, such as Egyptian, Assyrian, Syriac, Hebrew, include Egyptian, Assyrian, Syriac, and Hebrew, and even Greek words are in the Quran. The most notable prophecy about Rome reconquering Jerusalem, that could have been just simply a safe prediction prediction and secondly when was the Bible corrupted Muslims say today that the Old Testament and New Testament are corrupted but they say that it had to be truthful and trustworthy at the time of Muhammad but the problem with that we have manuscript evidence we have manuscripts that predate Muhammad's life and these manuscripts say exactly the way the Bible says today in the way it said back when it was originally given. When was the Bible corrupted? If they say before the Quran, then the Quran must have erred when it told Jews and Christians to trust a corrupted text to verify the truthfulness of the Quran. If they say after the Quran, then must, they must overlook the fact that we have manuscripts that existed prior to the Quran. The Quran judges the scriptures to be faithful, but twisted by their followers. However, we have the Bible and the message that we have, which the Quran says for us to believe, contradicts the message of the Quran. Unlike the prophets of the Bible, Muhammad had no supernatural evidence that he was called of God. 
He has no miracle, nothing that we say we should trust him. Only thing we have is the Quran. The Quran is uh, self-contradictory with it. It contradicts itself to saying that it is divine because of its literary style is, is no proof that it's divine. It would be like saying, I'm the strongest man in the world because I'm the most beautiful man in the world. Being beautiful doesn't mean necessarily you're strong. And being a beautiful piece of literature doesn't mean it's divine. So Muhammad is not to be trusted. There's nothing that verifies that he speaks on God's behalf. In fact, his life, if anything, undermines that he's an exemplar for us to follow. He was a murderer. Very prideful and arrogant man. He was adulterer. And it could be argued that he committed incest with his own daughter-in-law. But what should they believe about Jesus? One, they should believe that he is the pre-incarnate Son of God. Muhammad had little understanding of what the Bible actually said. He only had oral tradition and what was taught to him by the people around him. And, and, and Muhammad seemed to think that the word begotten meant that Christians believe that Jesus was begotten by God the Father and Mary. And Muhammad thought the Trinity was Father, Mary, and Jesus. That was his understanding of the Trinity. Surah 72, 33 through 4 says, And the exalted is the, the grandeur of our Lord. He never had a mate nor a child. But the fools among us used to say nonsense about God. Surah 4, 171. O people of the Scriptures, do not exaggerate in your religion and do not say about God except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, the Son of Mary, is the messenger of God and his word that he conveyed to Mary and the spirit from him. So believe in God and his messenger and do not say, three, refrain, it is better for you. God is only one, glory be to him, that he should have a son. To him belongs everything in the heavens and the earth. How can we trust the Quran when the Quran builds a straw men argument about the Trinity? If this is the eternal word of God written on tablets of gold from all eternity past, would you not think Allah would really understand what the Bible, the New Testament, says about the Trinity? But you see, the Quran doesn't understand the Trinity. Secondly, they, Jesus did, was crucified on the cross. Even Bart Ehrman, a liberal scholar, says one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified in the orders of the Roman prefect of Judah, Pontius Pilate. Even people who don't believe in Christianity says it is without a doubt historically that Jesus died on the cross. They may doubt his resurrection, but no legitimate scholar, historical scholar, doubts the fact that Jesus died on the cross. Also, they should believe that Jesus is our substitute. Remember how the Quran says that no one can bear the burdens of another. But however, one of the Hadith contradicts that. On the day of resurrection, my nation will be gathered into three groups. One sort will enter into paradise without rendering an account for their deeds. Another sort will be reckoned an easy account admitted into paradise. Yet another sort will come bearing on their backs heaps of sins like mountains. Allah will ask the angels, though he knows best about them, who are these people? They will reply, they are humble slaves of yours. He will say, unload the sins from them and put the same over the Jews and Christians. Then let the humble slaves go into paradise by virtue of my mercy. So even... Muhammad is saying these 
Muslims that may barely make it into paradise, one way that all is going to do that is take the sins off them and put them upon Jews and Christians. And us Jews and Christians will have to bear the sins of the Muslims. Isn't that a form of substitution? So when Muslims question us on the belief of substitutions, we can say, no, even though the Quran denies it, Muhammad says that Jews and Christians will bear the sins of Muslims. But we need to ask our question in conclusion. How can we believe that Jesus could die for our sins? How could God be just and knowingly place our sins upon someone who's innocent? Now let's think for a minute in conclusion here. If that was your daughter that was killed and the judge says, okay, I'm going to, um, I'm going to lock up his brother. In your grief, and in your sorrow, sorrow, you may think to yourself, well, as long as someone is punished, I'm happy. And you forget a moment because you're not thinking clearly. You go, okay, I accept that. The brother's going to have to possibly die. But what would happen six months later? Yeah, you begin to think about it. And you run into your daughter's murderer at Walmart. Then you begin to think, this is just not right. He's out free. This is not just. And an innocent man, innocent man is in prison. This has only made matters worse. So how can we believe as Christians that Christ died for our sins without God committing cosmic child abuse? Well, the Bible gives us an answer. The Bible says that in eternity plus that we were elected in Him. Jesus says, all that the Father has given me, I have lost none. Well, this election is in Christ. Even our election is in union with Jesus Christ, in Christ. Then God the Father took a particular people and says, Jesus, they are yours. They're your possessions. And Jesus took ownership of his people, his chosen people, and became legally responsible for his people. A couple years ago, me and my wife went to a flea market, and, and I guess it was Christian, our middle child, um, in a stroller, and of all the things in the flea market, there was this ugly little angel ceramic thing. Uh, all things, you know. And he reaches out his hand and swipes that thing off the table. That thing broke, too. And I'm there, with, I have a dilemma right there. Okay, okay, here's this ugly little thing. It's, my kid broke it. What do I do? Well, I could have done this. I could have went to the lady and says, you know, if you have a problem, take it up with my boy. He did it. I didn't do it. You take it up with him. He's two years old. You can take it up with him. But that's not the way it works, does it? I am my son's father. And I am his legal representative. And legally, in the, in the eyes of the law, we are one. Just like a marriage union. You and your husband and wives, they're one. One's debt is the other one's debt. One's riches, the other man's riches. Other ladies' riches. When my boy broke that, I had to go up and pay for it. As if it was my problem. As if I had broke it. It was just and right that I pay for it because my child is legally under my protection. The reason Christ can die in the atonement not be cosmic child abuse is because God gave His people, God gave His Son, Jesus, a people. And when we broke the law, when we broke that figurine, Jesus stood up and says, they're mine. They're mine. I'll take care of this. I will pay for their sins because they are in union with me. 
They've been chosen in me and they belong to me. And when he died on the cross, our names were written on the palms of his hands and upon his forehead. So when he died, we died with him. And the beauty of this, and this is what I want to close on. This is why Christianity is so much more beautiful than Islam. If you accepted the innocent brother to go to prison on behalf of the guilty brother, six months later, all of a sudden, you'd be enraged all over again. But that's not what God did. Just blindly takes an innocent person and treats him as he's guilty. But the Bible says, He made him who know no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of Christ in him. The why we're made the righteous of Christ is because we're in Him. And this means that our sins are eternally forgiven. Christ indeed paid for our sins in full. So, can we trust Muhammad? I believe by Muhammad's own testimony by the Hadiths and the Quran, he's an untrustworthy prophet and he's no sure God to follow. Jesus and Jesus alone is the only way to the Father.